So I'm going to move on from discussing the microwave background radiation as a radiation field and what it can tell us about the very early universe to looking at a particular effect on the microwave background radiation caused by one of the so-called microwave background foregrounds. That is one of the uh, structures superimposed on the microwave background radiation, in this case by clusters of galaxies. To uh, illustrate the point, you can think of the microwave background radiation as being uh, an illuminating background screen against which we can see the shadows of foreground objects. I've already talked about the SZ effect uh, in the first set of lectures as uh, something that can show that the illuminating screen lies behind the clusters, so giving you a minimum redshift of origin of the microwave background radiation. Here we'll look at that effect in a bit more detail. So here's a sketch of the microwave background radiation, the upper of the graphs uh, that uh, looks sort of like a thermal spectrum, where I've plotted the spectral intensity I knew as a function of frequency in gigahertz. Just below that spectrum on the left hand side is the distorted sort of spectrum that you get after a Snezodowicz effect has been in action. What happens is that as photons of the microwave background radiation pass through a cluster of galaxies, you have 3 degree Kelvin radiation going through gas at a temperature of 10 to the 7 Kelvin perhaps. A little bit of energy sharing means that the photons are bumped up in frequency, so they suffer a positive delta frequency and on the rising part of the thermal spectrum of the radiation field, that is the so-called Rayleigh genes part, that corresponds to a decrease in intensity of the spectrum, which is why these things can sometimes be called shadows. What's really happening is that more energy is being given to the radiation though, and it's shifting upwards. The diagonal line is the spectrum of Cygnus A. I've drawn it at the location on this picture that it would be if you tried to observe Cygnus A with a one square degree beam. And the point I want to make is that even such a bright radio source as Cygnus A, one of the dominant radio sources in the uh, radio sky, is puny compared with the microwave background radiation once you get to high frequencies. And it's even small compared with the Sinozadovich effect once you get above about 80 gigahertz. Okay, so let's um, estimate the size of these SZ effects. If you look at um, clusters of galaxies in the astrophysical literature over the last 30 or 40 years, you'll find that much of the discussion has been about their X-ray emission. Clusters of galaxies uh, are assemblages of thousands of galaxies into one gravitational potential well. That gravitational potential well is therefore very deep and the clusters can hold a very large, very hot gas atmosphere. Now the density of that atmosphere at its center is still pretty small, maybe a thousand protons per cubic meter. And because the gas is neutral, roughly a thousand electrons per cubic meter. The gas temperature is maybe six kilo electron volts and the scale size of one of these clusters is maybe a megaparsec. The picture on the right shows one such cluster, the cluster 0016 plus 16, which lies at a redshift more than a half. And as you can see by the scale bar, it is around two megaparsecs in diameter. It actually has a friend to the southwest, another small cluster to which it's bound, and there's another companion cluster to the north, but that's not relevant for our basic story. So what happens to 
a background microwave radiation field as it encounters a cluster. Well, you get scattering. And there's some optical depth to so-called inverse Compton scattering, which is the probability that a photon of the microwave background radiation coming through the cluster gets close enough to actually an electron, which does most of the scattering, to be changed in frequency. And that probability is just the number of scatterers per unit volume. I've written that as NP here, the number of protons, assuming that the gas is entirely hydrogen, Mu multiplied by the cross-sectional area and the cross-section for inverse Compton scattering at low energies is the Thompson scattering cross-section sigma t multiplied by the path length through the cluster and here I've taken about a megaparsec. And if you stir those numbers together with the parameters I wrote down on the previous slide you get 10 to the minus 2. That is there's a 1% probability that any photon of the microwave background radiation is scattered as it goes through a cluster. Now, because the particles that are doing the scattering are moving, those scatterings will all change the photon frequency. Now, you might at first have thought that, yes, but sometimes the photon and electron are moving in opposite directions, sometimes in the same direction. So some scatterings are up, some are down. That is true, but you get slightly more head-on scatterings. And the effect is then that the average photon frequency is changed by a fraction, that is, the ratio of the kinetic energy of the scatterers to the rest mass energy of the scatterers. And that's, since electrons are the scattering, about kT divided by mc squared, and for a 5 or 6 keV gas, the electron rest mass is 511 keV on C squared. That gives you a ratio of about 10 to the minus 2. So the average photon that is scattered is scattered by about 1% in frequency. So 1% of the photons are scattered, 1% change of frequency. So the overall change is about 10 to the minus 4. There's actually a factor of 2 comes in here because the Rayleigh genes part of the spectrum is arising with a spectral index of 2. But we call the product of the fractional frequency change and the optical depth the Y parameter, the Compton Y parameter. At low frequencies, that gives an intensity change in the microwave background radiation. <coughs> That's just minus 2y. <coughs> I can write that either in brightness temperature terms or in flux density terms. In brightness temperature terms, it's simpler. The brightness temperature of the center of a cluster will change by the brightness of what you're shining on it. And in temperature terms, that's the temperature of the microwave background radiation, 2.7 Kelvin, multiplied by this scattering factor and the factor of 2. And that's of order 300 microkelvin. That brightness temperature effect depends only on the properties of the cluster, the intrinsic properties of the cluster. And so it's independent of redshift. That means that if you can observe this brightness temperature change, you should be able to see a Sr. Zadovich effect from any cluster anywhere in the universe. Now, if you have insufficient angular resolution, so you're not looking along a small beam through the middle of a cluster, but integrating over an entire cluster, or averaging things down, then you don't measure the central brightness temperature effect. You measure a sort of an average. And you measure a flux density. And the flux density is given by brightness temperature times solid angle times some factors. And that means that the flux density effect decreases 
as the distance of the cluster square. So more distant objects have a lower flux density. Well, that's sort of true, but because the flux density effect depends on angular diameter distance, not luminosity distance, the flux density of one of these clusters decreases out to about redshift 1.6 and then increases again because the angular diameter distance in an expanding flat universe dominated by dark energy reaches a maximum at some redshift. Very distant objects have larger angular sizes. So the flux density effect can go back up and potentially clusters of galaxies can get brighter again. So the SZ effect could be an excellent way of finding extremely distant clusters of galaxies. And that's of interest if you're studying how structure in the universe has changed over cosmic time. In a little more detail, the scattering probability is quite a complicated function of the frequency of a photon that is striking the scatterers. What I've plotted here is the probability with an that an electron with some speed causes some frequency change. And at low speed, you get a very narrow kernel, low scattering, a low and very symmetric scattering pattern. As you go to uh, speeds that becoming relativistic, that scattering beca pattern becomes very asymmetrical. Basically, up scattering becomes much more frequent than down scattering. So you tend to get uh, a distortion of the shape of the, the scattering. If I calculate that averaging over all electrons in a population of electrons at 5 keV on the left, 15 keV on the right, you get a very symmetrical pattern at about 5 keV, a rather asymmetrical pattern at 15 keV, and that pattern, that asymmetry, becomes even more pronounced at higher temperatures. What we say is that the shape is deviating from the so-called Compagniates kernel, which is the scattering expression derived from uh, the Compagniates equation. It was first derived in the 1940s. Well, that's what a single scattering does. <clears throat> we need to now look to see what the change in the spectrum is, of the microwave background radiation that results from these scatterings. And you get spectral shapes that look like this. The upper one shows the brightness temperature change in the microwave background radiation. And that's largest at low frequencies starts negative because you're up scattering and the intensity of the radiation drops. Beyond a certain point, around 220 gigahertz, it becomes positive because you're beyond the peak and any up scattering of microwave background photons then increases the intensity and then it drops off as you go to very high frequency. In flux density terms, you change the intensity by dividing by wavelength squared, you multiply by frequency squared, and you get this very odd looking spectral shape where you go from zero at low frequency to a maximum negative at about 120 gigahertz to a maximum positive at about 360 gigahertz, and then it decreases. For typical clusters, the shape of this spectrum has a weak dependence on electron temperature. Uh, which is of some interest, and that's because of the asymmetry of the scattering kernel changing as the energies of the scattering electrons changes. There are not many phenomena in astrophysics that produce both an absorption and an emission. And this unique spectral signature of the Sinyazadovich effect potentially makes it rather easy to see <clears throat> 
if you look at a cluster of galaxies with many different frequencies. What does the sky look like? like? Well, most of the sky is covered by clusters of galaxies or protoclusters. So if you were to look at the sky with very high signal to noise, you would expect to see it completely covered by little patches of Sinozadovich effect. This is uh, a plot of the um, Compton Y parameter as a function of position over a representative about 10 square degree chunk of sky. You can see several prominent clusters, the bright red blobs, a lot of yellowish stuff and a lot of light blue. Now I should say straight away that this is logarithmically encoded. So the few bright things stand out dramatically and there's a lot of very, very faint things that would be extremely hard to see. I should also say that this plot ignores primordial fluctuations in the microwave background radiation, the fluctuations that are caused by structure at decoupling. That produces, in my paper analogy, a lumpiness in the background screen, the piece of paper that these shadows are appearing on. And that can make them hard to see. But the spectrum of primordial fluctuations is quite different from the spectrum of the Sinyazadovich effect. Now I talked about primordial fluctuations from the point of view of power spectrum. Let's do the same thing for the SZ effect. The upper solid line <coughs> shows the power spectrum of primordial fluctuations, structure forming fluctuations. Below it in dashed lines you see the thermal SZ effect, which is what I've just been describing, and below that a thing I've called the kinematic SZ effect, and that is what you get if the clusters are moving relative to the microwave background radiation. Now remember, our galaxy is moving at around 600 kilometers per second relative to the average microwave background radiation you'd expect all clusters to be moving at some speed, maybe 100 or 200 kilometers per second. And that will give you this sort of kinematic SZ effect signature. It has a different spectrum, so it can be distinguished from the thermal effect, but also contributes power. And the bottom curve shows the so-called Birkinshaw gull effect, which is a, a, like the kinematic effect, but rather than being along the line of sight, it's a transverse effect. And it comes about by gravitational lensing of the microwave background radiation. What you can see is that the SZ effects start to cut in and affect the power spectrum at mode numbers L greater than about two or three thousand. That means that the COBE experiment and the WMAP experiment were very insensitive to Sinyazadovich effects, but Planck, which could see out to a K of three or four thousand quite easily, is sensitive to the SZ effect and would be expected to find clusters of galaxies from its very good spectral coverage by analysing the data appropriately. Essentially, the SZ effect dominates the lumpiness of the microwave background radiation once you start to look on scales less than a few arc minutes. Those are also the scales on which radio sources tend to exist. And of course, radio sources are associated with galaxies and galaxies tend to cluster in clusters of galaxies, hence the name. So a potential problem with SZ effect observation is going to be looking for the effect in the presence of radio emission in clusters. So let me summarize what you can learn by studying the SZ effect. It's a redshift independent function of the properties of a cluster. And as I'll show in the next mini segment, it's a measure of cluster thermal energy. That is, it's a calorimeter. It tells you how much heating the gas in a cluster has ever had. <coughs>
It's a mass finder because it's an unambiguous signature of where there's a lot of hot gas. And because you can measure um, the kinematic effect, you can measure the velocities of clusters of galaxies relative to the micro background radiation. So you've got a speedometer. There are more signals available, in fact, in polarization. Uh, and you could potentially measure SZ effect polarization, but that signal is tiny. And I won't discuss it further here. I'll stop at this point and in the next mini segment we'll start to talk about the sort of science you can do on clusters.